And if you're just trusting or believing, then that will become part of your life and become integrated as a solution. But you must keep believing. And so then people rededicate themselves to God for all their lives because they can't seem to live that perfect life or they can't seem to inherit that perfect life. And they keep reflecting that it's, maybe it's my fault. What, what do you think about that type of... Um, oh, it's funny. When I was, I was nine when I said the salvation prayer. I think yeah. it was nine. Um, and I remember when I was a young teenager, um, off and on throughout my youth, I would say the salvation prayer just in case. You know, mm -hmm. I had a bad thought or I told a lie or I was rebellious or I don't know if I did anything wrong, but I sure don't want to go to hell. So dear Lord, please forgive me for that thought. And dear Lord, please forgive me for this. Dear Lord, please, I know I'm unworthy. I know I'm unworthy. I mean, I didn't realize how damaged I was at the moment because right. this is framed as healthy. We must realize that uh, we are unworthy and only at our at our realization that God is the only out is, you know, this true salvation come. And, uh, I don't know how many times I got saved <laughs> when I was a kid. I, but I, I, I told myself, I felt the spirit. I told myself I felt something, but I really think I was trying to convince myself. Uh, and what I did feel that was real was, in those moments of euphoria, conditioned response, the music swelling and the pastor's voices, you yeah. know, wailing from behind the microphone and people there's, are putting their arms around you. There's physical touch and there's encouragement and hugs and tears. And this sensory overload sometimes comes across like uh, it, it produces a kind of euphoria that you could easily mistake for something else. And, um, you know, I, a lot of the work that I do today isn't, it's not directed around the deists and the casual Sunday Christians. It, my work really speaks against those who are still preaching this literal fundamentalist message of you are born with original sin. You don't deserve goodness or heaven. Mm. Certainly you do deserve hell. Um, and the, everything that you get that's good has to come from outside of you. Uh, that's the focus of my work right now. It's amazing. If you'd have told me when I was a Christian that as an atheist, I would have more purpose, not less. I, I've been, what? But I do. It's self-generated purpose. Yeah. But it's, I have a greater sense of purpose now. I have more love in my life. I, I'm happier than I, I ever was as a Christian. I, I get to make every day a discovery. I don't have to fake it when I don't know the answer, when I don't know what to scribble in the blanks. I know I'm not going to live forever, but instead of, of feeling like this life is just a, an exercise in futility, the temporary nature of my life actually makes every moment more critical. So now I'm more inclined to, to not waste time. Now I'm more inclined to say what needs to be said and make the phone call and grab the, the picket sign and, and uh, be an activist and try to help change the world and, and uh, elevate, you know, humanity including myself everybody you know let's go out and and all of that was a product of me rejecting a religion it was something i never would have expected and yet it's been true in my own life my life is better as an atheist than it ever was with the idea or belief in god so speaking of your development after your belief in some of the things that you now find value in regarding your own life um I'm going to ask you a question about that. So I have a friend over on the live feed right now, uh, Bud Askins, is asking, um, people who convert to a religion are encouraged to grow through reading, religious texts, praying, etc. cetera. Um, but what should folks who deconvert be doing? And that's what I wonder too. Well, I, I'm trying to, I mean, I think... Part of the human condition should be trying to be better tomorrow than we are today. Yeah. Try to know more tomorrow than we are today, uh, than we do today. Um, be wiser to make better decisions, to, um, to try to uh, have more, be more, affect more positive change tomorrow than we did today. I, I think, you know, human growth is just something we should aspire to. Uh, in all aspects, I don't think that's, uh, I mean, and I would challenge whether or not uh, 
you know, becoming more entrenched in dogma isn't what I would call growth, although I understand what your questioner is asking. Uh, you know, study the Bible, pray more, uh, pray more often, pray longer, pray with more conviction and faith. I mean, that's what the church calls growth, but yeah. I, I, I would not. I would say it's actually a regression. You're, you, you do not at that moment have a personal relationship with reality. And so uh, I see personal growth as understanding that we will never know everything, understanding how vast uh, our universe is and the universe doesn't care if we exist and that's okay. And then trying to create a sense of um, fulfillment and meaning and purpose and and do it on our own terms to populate our life with people who matter to us, who respect us and love us and bring goodness to us, to try to do the same for others, to make them better. And I, I just think that's part of the human condition. So I don't know if that answers your question, but that's kind of my philosophy on life. Sounds like in a nutshell, you're calling for an attitude adjustment. <laughs> well, I, I just, this idea that you must decrease so that God can increase. It just, the whole thing's about slavery, slavery of yeah. the mind, of the intellect, of our emotions, of our identity. The church just, it messes everything up. You know, it, it, it even the, the charitable, wonderful work that the church does, and the church, do, this is controversial to say, the church does a lot of good work. They do it with religious window dressing that's not needed. But like if a church goes down in, on their mission trip and builds shelters and provides medicine in a third world town or village, they're helping people. They're giving clothes to those who have none. They are providing a support mechanism, maybe even helping to build schools, all those things. That's helping. But you know they have this sort of mythological window dressing that really is a distraction. It's part of the problem. What they're doing is humanism. It's humanistic work. It's human hands doing all the heavy lifting anyway. We should just sort of slough off this mythological backstory and let's focus on people, which is what we were about in the first place. How authentic is your relationship with a loved one who has who believes in God, is a Christian, has learned that you're an atheist, believes that you will go to hell, <laughs> but doesn't make any more of an effort um, or is just okay with you being an atheist? Uh, we'll put it that way. And that question is asked by Kevin Waddy. Thanks, so, Kevin. Well, there's a. Let me give you a couple of contrasting examples. I'll yeah. I'll go back and forgive me to my mother and father, but let me go back to my parents. My father believes in a literal hell. I mean, fire and brimstone, sulfur and smoke, and he believes that I'm going there. Okay, and mm -hmm. he's he's grieved and he's worried and he's horrified and he's terrified, and much of the last 10 years has been effort after effort, email after text, after sermon, after whatever, to try to get me back on track. Okay? And uh, he, he genuinely believes I'm going to hell. What's wacky about that is that I've asked him point blank, you think God's going to put me in hell? Yeah. But do you love God? Yeah. So you love the guy who's going to burn me forever? And exactly. he just can't process it, right? He he tilts, he kind of, and then he always comes back to free will or turn or burn kind of thing, right? And he cannot wreck, he cannot, we don't have a relationship because for him, the eternal question must be solved before we can really do a whole lot else, okay? And this yeah. is true of my mother to a slightly lesser degree. She believes in a slightly different kind of hell. But I mean, it's it's been tough. I am married to a Christian. Natalie, oh. not, Natalie's not an atheist. Okay, I didn't know that. Now, Natalie is she's not a, a fundamentalist at all. I honestly, she's really more of a deist. Uh, we've had this discussion, honey. You say you're. She was raised in the Christian church, Christian music, Christian everything, but she doesn't. She, we don't go to church. She doesn't pray before meals. She doesn't really know much about what's in the Bible. She really has sort of this. Uh, a, casual cultural faith that she has embraced. And we've had our long, long talks. And at the end of the day, though, the difference is, is that Natalie is very much a supporter in, of people being who they are. And when she looks at me, she doesn't see the label atheist. She sees Seth's a good man. Mm -hmm. Seth was a good enough man for me to bond my life with him. He's good to my children. 
Mm. He makes me laugh. He is a life partner and a moral person who loves helping others. And, you know, she sees me as a human being far beyond any other label. And so even though we disagree theologically, philosophically on some key stuff, and that's provided some challenges, far beyond that, she celebrates my right to be me, to pursue truth on my terms. She'll come out to conventions with me sometimes. She'll help me work the book table. She'll, she will support me in any way that she can. So it's interesting because you have her as a Christian who's like, Seth, I'm happy for you. And I hope you succeed in whatever you do. And you have my parents who are Christians who are like, holy shit, he's going to hell. And, you know, it's just weird to see the two sides of that coin, both calling themselves Christians and yet operating so differently.